Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey, so today we're going to talk about is adding additional features um, to your program a balancing act? Awesome. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. So uh, it's Jackie from Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm Joe from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and today we're going to talk about uh, adding additional features to your program, which absolutely can be a balancing act, or at least that's how we feel about it. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's a lot of tools out there. And, you know, I think often people shy away from tools that are so complex. So it, it's not a certainty that you should add, you know, everything in the world under the kitchen sink to your tool, I think. Yeah, I, I think the balancing is making sure the stuff that you add actually um, truly does add to the program. If you've made yeah, the simplest uh, text editor in the world and sold it as such, um, trying to become Word might not be the way to go. Right? It, it, it is something to keep in mind. What is your user base? What is the actual reason that your program is being used instead of others and stuff like that? So actually balancing that, it there can be many aspects of it, but if you have a steady user base, it, it might be an okay idea to ask them and uh, hear them out for, for stuff like that. But should you always just add whatever they ask for? Because um, it, it, it will be considered an improvement, but it will slowly eat away at how simple that tool really is. Well, let me alter just slightly what you just said. It will be considered an improvement by some, right? And, and I think you're right. The other, most people would never say, oh, I hate that new new thing I can do, right? It, that, but it'll be more of a subjective kind of thing. If like, you know, the tool used to be easier and very clear how to do something. And now it's, it's a little more complicated, right? So I think you're right. It's it's not a straight away a negative, um, but you do lose that focus. And I love your analogy of, of uh, an editor type of thing. And you think about um, Notepad, and how simple of a program it is. And yet, I mean, if you compare it to at least like the Windows 3.11 version of, of Notepad, it's really close. I mean, it, it hasn't changed much in, in 30 years. Um, and because they identified a lot of that core functionality and, you know, it's a very lightweight program and it's so stable um, that people use it. Now, it's not our favorite thing for doing stuff, but it, the core opening a file, hey, you know, works, works great. I, I'd say I still use it for different things like, oh, I need to dump a piece of text uh, and I don't want to keep the formatting and stuff like that. Um, one of the go-to things I do is just, oh, the notepad I have opened there and put it in at the end. And I may not have to actually use it for anything, but I do not need to remember what clipboard store I stored it in, or uh, I don't have all kinds of visual noise from post-it notes or whatever it might be. So from time to time, I still use it for something that there are many other tools that can do. But it's just there. I've always known about it, and it doesn't do anything new all of a sudden. Right, which in today's world, often it's nice having that old pair of shoes that you're used to, right? You're comfortable with and you, you know exactly how it works and you don't have to worry that every other day it's something's different about it. Uh, and, and and let's, you know, let's throw out some numbers here. If if you have a good customer user base, and here's something else you'd, you'd want to consider, right? Is are there other tools out there already doing what you offer? Um, do you think that you actually would gain, you know, people don't use your tool because it doesn't have that functionality versus are you really going to get a, you know, so are you going to get a lift if you add it? Are you going to get a lift of new people coming in or happier customers, you know, that, that now use your tool? Um, I think it's a really critical thing to think through, you know, that alone. 
Yeah, it, it, it goes to knowing your user base, absolutely, and building that persona that you're selling to or or whoever you're making it for or why you're making it and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, uh, simply adding features is mm, something where, let's say you were a hobbyist making something for yourself and you kept improving it for your own needs. And, and sure enough, you have other users. They're welcome to use it. They use it because they've found it nice or because they can contribute to it or whatever reason. Um, but if you add features or maybe if you change features, you could easily end up in maybe not a shitstorm, but at least in some kind of negative feedback uh, from from doing stuff like that oh ab- and- absolutely yeah. sorry but i was just i, I totally uh, understand and 100 percent agree with that point of you will never please everybody right so every time you hey everyone will love this i'm going to add this i can guarantee you there's going to be a percentage of people that hate it right for whatever reason people just don't like change right so yeah, it's a really good point. Um, something else to consider, which I, I totally, and I think of QAP, Quick Access Pop-Up, as one of these tools kind of I'm envisioning as we're talking it through. The uh, the functionality he has added to, to it is quite, a, it's great, it's amazing, right? It has so much functionality. Often he'll add new stuff from users. Like I've actually suggested many things and he's incorporated them into it. Uh, but at the same time, one is you're annoying, possibly annoying your current base. You know, you're adding new functionality. It makes it more complex and more time consuming to learn. But at the same time, you're adding possible more work and support. One in the programming and it breaking and two is just having to answer questions all the time, right? About that new functionality. And, and again, unless you're really getting a big lift, I'm not so sure it's, you know, a really big win. You no, know, and I know one of the points we talked about here was, should you add features that are only used by, let's say, 20% of your user base? And the ideas of, of looking at it that way is, mm, if it's easy, if it was something you were just going to do, that sounds nice and well and stuff. But if it adds complexity to other tasks that would last 80% of your user base, um, actually uses, why are you catering to that 20%? Not because it's a bad thing uh, always to do, uh, and more often than not, maybe it's only 20% of your users that are actually actively communicating their uh, wishes with you. So so who should you listen to if not the people who actually give uh, uh, you input? But within some kind of reason you you will maybe add a feature that these 20 percent over here like or wish to have but you get questions about it from these 40 percent over here because they now don't fully understand how to do the thing after you add change the feature or added something so yeah yeah the, the other thing i was going to add to that is uh i i've written a tool, a GUI, and it sounds crazy because I don't work in GUIs, but I actually, I actually did this uh, myself, and it uh, it wraps FFmpeg, and so um, this one basically will use the H.265 encoding, and it actually has options. You can do different things with it um, as far as the encoding, how fast you want it to go, this and that, and then I have like five other scripts that I purposely chose, and I said, you know what? I could keep adding to this GUI I have of having options because one of them, it'll just, you drop in your videos and it, and it converts it and shrinks it down usually like half the file size, maybe even a quarter of the file size, which is awesome. Um, The other tool that I use a lot is it, um, you can take audio, you drop it in there and you tell it, I want all these audios to be like twice as loud. And so it adjusts the audio across all of them. Um, And then a third version of it, it, I actually use it for our podcasts. After we record all the stuff and save it, it rips the, the MP3 file out for me and saves it as a file. Now, all of those I could have put in that one GUI. However, 
to me, it's a very different user base that would be doing this. I happen to do them all, but I think the vast majority of people, they come in, they have one one thing that they plan to do. And it's not, it's rarely that it's all those things. And so it's so simple, right? Have different versions of your tool, right? And just keep them as separate tools. And um, I, I personally, I think it's really smart in that sense of, I think it really does have to do with that target audience. Do they often do all the things or do they do them individually and you have different people that want them? And in that case, you know, consider different versions. And we, we've talked about weird different ways of doing stuff over the years. And we've also talked about people uh, not using um, the more complex parts of some programs we knew they did at some point and and maybe we just don't know enough people that use it anymore but we're not seeing let's say macros in in some of the office programs and stuff like that um it was there but it's in essence it's almost being um negated out i i don't know how to put that because if you look at Microsoft 365, you can't really use the macros in the cloud. Uh, so only on your local version can you actually use them. And if it's slowly shifting into the cloud and there at some point won't be any type of desktop uh, version and you only have, let's say, a, a virtual, virt virtual, virtual, I can't say that, um, version of it, that's just displayed like Citrix or something else. Right. Uh, on yeah, yeah. Then that functionality, hmm, there will be a lot of your user base who rely on it, but let's say it was only 20%. Um, should Microsoft keep catering to those? Um, at one point it made a lot of sense, but now when I look in the office environment, there are so few people who truly understand the power of that side of the office programs. So for Microsoft and their development, they're trying to go the, the simpler route, the, the easy, um, here you have a button and that does it. And mm -hmm. you're, they're, they're not expecting you to sit down and make a complex macro to get your thing to happen. And in that aspect, it, it might be what we are seeing in a lot of cases. It needs to be mobile friendly. It needs to be very simple, very large icons and stuff like that. And when you look at um, it that way, sure, that, that's, that's a way of doing it. But it takes them quite a lot of time to get there, right? They need to keep supporting um, the old users because if they just close the door on them, they might get so big of a backlash that, I don't know, we re recently talked about how the hotkey version two, no longer supporting some of the oldest versions of Windows, which is probably fine because people really shouldn't be on those anymore. But yeah, when should you stop supporting old functionality? And when did you stop actually adding new? No, it's awesome. Yeah, you know. yeah. And actually, again, I would I would get back to the example you were just talking about there. In general, with with Office three sixty, whatever the tool is, it doesn't really matter, right? Is you're going to have a core group of people that are basically power users, however you want to term them, right? They're much more, much, much more advanced. And they're in your tool a lot, and they know all the the weeds and all the little stuff. And the vast majority use you know five percent of its functionality, right? And and um, and again, I would say, you know, can you either creatively create a GUI structure that allows the simplicity for the vast majority, but then you hit a button, and now I have all these advanced options, right? Um, or B. Again, have it have it as a separate version, right? And that way, because when in your example, which I, th I think you're spot on, Jackie, is uh, if they did take away all the development tools, all you know, for like let's say Word, um, if you can no longer submit VBA or, or do a lot of that kind of stuff, people a lot they 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 would get hammered very hard. However, having that stuff in there. For people who aren't power users, it can often confuse them, 
right? And and this is where it's like, hey, you know, find a good way to make it simple, kind of like like they've done. It, for the most part, you got to go to that developer tab and get into this new environment that you almost don't even know it exists. I, exactly. I know from the newest version 2019 or whatever the version it is now, um, you actually need to go into the settings of which tabs are visible because the developer tab is turned off by default. So people who don't know about it, who didn't use Word 10 years ago or whatever, they have no way of actually learning about it from just using Word because yeah. who actually goes into Word settings and down to the general one and into the which tabs are turned on and oh there's one that doesn't have a, a, a tick in it and turn it on and look at it and say oh let me try and click these buttons and then actually figure out oh there is a fully programmable uh, interface here they'll probably see it online when they have an issue uh, or have some colleague or friend tell them about it but just discovering it like the rest of us did years ago when it was that big thing it was almost on the front of the actual uh, functionalities of what the program could do or you could record a macro and then it could repeat what you did it was great and you could get more advanced than that but now it's pushed so far back and um, we, we had an entry where Sometimes you may not want to add features that are so you rarely used, or you may just decide to keep your tools simple and have a different tool that does the new functionality. And that's what Microsoft is trying to opt for. They're trying to slowly remove the macroing functionality from their office programs and moving it into the Microsoft Cloud, the Power Automate, the flows and all those different things and it is in it's a way of trying to say you know what if you want to have support of how to do a flow you have a team for that mm -hmm. you don't want to build it into excel and word and outlook and whatnot and have a team for every simple say a single program it, it, it's a great way of doing it but um they're just the other way around because they already had the features and they're not right. trying to uh, do it in a different way where we would probably be the ones to say if you didn't add the feature in the first place you'll save yourself quite a lot of um, support headache might be a way of putting it um, without really gaining um, or losing that much yeah, I, of course, it depends on, you know, your specific tool and your target base, right? And if it's something that people are going to really enjoy or possibly even pay a premium for, right, then, again, consider having it as a separate tool. But, yeah, and actually, when you were mentioning that with the uh, how you have to go turn on developer mode in, in Office, it reminded me also on an Android phone to get into the developer mode you know to, to turn it on it's it's uh, i don't know how they came up with the approach that they have but um clearly you know you have to go to that one thing and hit it like seven times to to trigger developer mode um clearly they purposely made that difficult right for a reason you you, you would not know i've seen on some phone models will start counting down for you but oh. who will actually go to that setting and look at the version number and be like well push that i'll push it again again oh oh starting a countdown who does that way into the so yeah you you need to know to actually uh, find that out so clearly they purposely made it you know very obscure so yeah. only people who and it's it's kind of interesting because they actually made it, and actually maybe Microsoft, I think you could argue still, they did make it hard, a little hard, is they make you jump through some hoops in order to turn it on. And they're like, hey, if they're not smart enough to figure out how to do this, they shouldn't be, you know, actually in no, it. That you don't long. even want them on their yeah. support phone. If Brilliant. you can't do that. So it's an okay way of setting the bar, so to speak. So, so yeah, it, it's not 
bad in that aspect. But yeah, I, I was just um, like Microsoft. They have at least done some clever things. They they made maybe the most user friendly control program for uh, personal computers. I'll, I'll give them that. And within a few years, they'd made um, it look a little different. And they actually managed to sell people on that. And a few years later, they did it again. And they sold them the same program, um, same name and everything. They might have changed the number, but still, it's Windows. And we're still sitting here and Right now, my computer is notifying me that Windows 11 is ready to be done or be installed. And lots of people have changed over to that. Now, they're no longer actually charging you, or they may not be charging you if you're not premium or something. But they're still keeping you in their um, environment and making sure that the stuff that works best with this is our program or our cloud or whatever it might be so yeah it it it's a great model where you can have a simple tool that people love if you get a good idea you might not need to just free of charge add it to your tool mm-hmm. um, so uh, sorry another really good example for me at least is the uh the mice window snipping tool and over the years, a lot of people have said, hey, you know, it'd be great if you could add this or add this. I'm like, that's why I give you the source code, right? Because I'm like, it does everything I want it, I personally want it to do, and I'm happy with. Um, it's very rare I add functionality to it just because it's, 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 I don't want something that does all these other things that like I, I or the vast majority of people ever do. Yeah. And that, that's one of the places where, I don't know now what you need to, where, where a payment level needs to be or how advanced your tool need to be to actually warrant uh, pay and, and stuff like that. But I can't remember the name of it, but I think it's the same people that are making Camtasia, they're making one that's called Snagit or something. Yes. And yeah. I do believe it has a premium version or may, or it's free. I, I don't remember. It's, it's a, some time ago, but it started out being very simple. It was a little better than Windows uh, Clip It tool. Um, and now it's involved into something that can do a lot of things. And I'm not sure it's really unique enough in itself to truly warrant its own price unless you have that specific thing that you'd use that for because you could probably just as easily use a snippet tool or a screen recorder and an editor or whatever it might be yeah i think some and again it, it like the ffmp examples i was talking about i <clears throat> i could sell something like that for like five bucks Right, like I could, and each of them would be five bucks, and people I don't think would mind buying multiple different versions of my tool that wraps FFmpeg, you know, um, for five bucks because hey, it's cheap, right? And it does just that. Uh, but yeah, I think if it is, it it does become very complicated. And again, you have to look at your competitors as well, who's offering what, in order to start understanding that. Yeah, and and how how for how long should you be offering updates for it? And if you make vast enough improvements, should you do like Windows and say, oh, you know what? This is no longer the same program. This is now a new version. It jumped two numbers. You you can see the two numbers, right? Um, You fully understand that I made a great snipping tool, version two. And now I've made version five. And you actually need to pay again to get version five. And... I think that's one of the things that small time developers often forget that there should be some kind of bar to how that works. Either you have a subscription or something like that, or if you actually do make vast enough changes to a program, it should probably warrant another buy-in or a download or whatever it might be. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let us know what you think as far as do you add anything and everything to your scripts, right? Do you limit? Do you decide? Do you talk to your customers or people using it? 
do you just do it yourself? And um, I, I'm curious. Yeah, um, me too. Absolutely. Okay, good talk to you, Jackie. Yeah, bye.